Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Crockcast Podcast. I'm your host, Nate, along with my co-host, Matt. Hey. And today we're joined by uh, Rattlesnake researcher, Saunders Drunker. Saunders, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. So, uh, Saunders, you want to tell us a little bit about how you first got into uh, herps and herpetology? Yeah, uh, I guess we can start way back at the beginning. Um so I, I was one of those, one of those people, one of those kids who was just into herps ever since I was, I was real little, you know, um, ever since my, my first ever interaction with a snake, we had a gopher snake that lived in the wood pile by our house. Um, ever since then, it was just like all that I wanted to do, you know, and as a little kid, I was, you know, flipping rocks in my gardens, catching anoles and toads, you know, get super excited when you find a garter snake and a, in a water snake. Um, just that sort of like little kid, easy, you know, herping sort of stuff that you do and finding all the little backyard animals. Um, and I don't know, it's kind of hard to say like, Oh, this is, this is why I got into it, but it was just, it, it was what I always wanted to do. Um, and I think, a lot of that ties back to, you know, a positive first interaction with a snake at a real young age. And then since then it was, you know, as I grew up asking my parents to like take me cruising or, you know, finding the local herp experts in my, in my neighborhoods, I live pretty close to uh, Dave Barker and Ron Tremper and Brad Chambers uh, growing up, which you know, those three guys, herpetologists, a whole wealth of knowledge and, you know, got in touch with them when I was a kid. I helped with a bunch of water snake surveys with Dave Barker at my local nature center ever since I was, I think like seven or eight years old, uh, just real little kid going out there, uh, jumping in the water after water snakes, getting bit, getting muddy, getting musked on all that good stuff that, that everybody that everybody loves. Um, And then, you know, it it came time to, to choose a a place to go to college, uh, choose kind of what I wanted to do. And herbs were it. I I went and I got a biology degree from Sewanee, the university of the South. Although actually, I guess technically my degree was in ecology and biodiversity. Um, So looking into habitats and the way that animals fit in with their habitats. And once I was up there, I got really into the salamanders that lived up there. Um, Swanee has something like 35 different species of salamanders that live on campus. Um, And there's a a whole bunch of other species within a pretty short drive. So I got real into salamanders up there. I still loved them, but they were a, a fantastic study uh, study species or study taxa for me to do some good research on and, you know, pave my way to now as surprising as it is to say, um, to being like an actual herp researcher. Um, I kind of, sometimes I'm like kind of hesitant to call myself a herpetologist, I guess, cause I'm still in school. Um, but technically I do, I do make money for, for doing reptile and amphibian work. And so, I guess I'm living the dream. If, if eight year old Saunders could see me now, uh, he'd probably be pretty excited. <laughs> um, so you're originally from the San Antonio region, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, lived in and around San Antonio for, for most of my childhood, at least the parts I can remember. I was born out in New Mexico, but we moved when I was really young. Yeah, uh, me and Matt have a mutual friend who just moved to San Antonio, so we're kind of wondering what the herping was like down around there. Mm. Yeah, San Antonio is a, a real good city. I think uh, Bear County, the county that San Antonio is in, it has like the highest herp diversity of any county in the U.S. Um, wow. And that's that's going back through all historical records. You know, it's pretty well developed now, so some species that might have been recorded there a long time ago aren't really that easy to find anymore. Uh, but Bear County and San Antonio sits right at this, this junction between the, the Texas Hill country, um, which has some like West Texas species in it, the South Texas thorn scrub. So you get South Texas species 
and then you get other things kind of creeping over from uh from east texas as uh, well as well it's just in a fantastic sort of habitat transition zone and there's a, a lot of species of herbs to be found there that's awesome so are you so you mentioned you also have a um you also like salamanders a lot what 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 would be your favorite type of uh reptile like snakes lizards salamander or well salamanders or amphibians but Mm. I guess I guess hurt. Uh, it's hard, hurt? <laughs> yeah it's a hard que- it's a hard question to answer um I, I love snakes when I was a little kid snakes were just so cool um partially because like I don't know when you're a little kid snakes are the thing that you're you're not allowed to touch you know you're yeah. not al- your your parents tell you like don't pick up snakes don't catch snakes you know they can be they can be poisonous or they can be venomous actually um but salamanders hold a, a really special place in my heart. Um, I did like three years of salamander research when I was in Tennessee um, oh. on quite a few different species. Uh, I've personally given like little uh, visible elastomer tags, little tattoos to like 4,000 different individual salamanders. Um, so I've spent a lot of time with salamanders. And they're, I don't know, they're just such wholesome little creatures. They're adorable. I love their, like, really specific habitat niches. One of the species that I worked on back in Tennessee, um, like, it lives only at the junctions between, like, this shale geologic layer and the sandstone geologic layer. In some spots, it's got, like, you know, its entire habitat in a creek will be like two square meters of habitat. And that's the only place that it lives in that whole creek system. Um, and I love weird little biogeographical patterns like that. Um, yeah. It's just super specific and looking for that, those sorts of species with super specific habitat preferences, I find really fun. Cause you know, you're, you got to learn about the geology. You got to learn about like the plant communities, the different watersheds, um, and then whenever you do find those species in those really specific spots, it's incredibly rewarding to me. But on the same, or on the other hand, rattlesnakes are just so cool. Um, I, I'm a sucker for rattlesnakes. Uh, the, I really like a lot of the little montane species. And a lot of them exhibit really specific habitat preferences or really specific range preferences. Um, and they're just beautiful and i think that they're a lot more intelligent than people like to think um whenever i'm working with them i see them display intelligence and that's really just really grabbed my heart since i started working with them um what what would you say well let me let me well okay so what would you say is your favorite uh type of salamander then or what, what's fa- the coolest one you found? Let me, let me. The coolest one that I found is probably either a hellbender, which are incredible and there's nothing yeah. else really like them in the U S um, my bucket list to find. Oh, uh, they're so cool. Um, also really cool one that I found um, several times were Tennessee cave salamanders, gyronophilus paleucus. Mm. Yeah. Just a, you know, aquatic cave dwelling salamander with really limited range in this sort of like karst cavey area of Tennessee, Alabama, and Georgia. But overall, my favorite species of salamander and one of my favorite organisms on earth is the, the Cumberland dusky salamander, Despignathus abditus, which is the one that most of my research focused on. Uh, it has really specific habitat preferences. It lives in like, the areas where it lives is really prone to having waterfalls and so you'll go to like this beautiful gorgeous like 60 foot waterfall and just all over the cliff living like green salamanders but still in the water in the stream you have these little salamanders that they're despignathus most of the time they're little brown salamanders and aren't too impressive to look at but their ecology is fantastic their behavior is fantastic and every once in a while they uh they do sport some really cool sort of like red and yellow colors. Um, And I just fell in love with that species. Um, 
and I haven't seen one in like three or four years and it's killing me. I need to get back to Tennessee and, and look for them again. How does that one differ from um, like a Southern Dusky Salamander? Because I, I, I'm from Georgia originally. I find a lot of those over by my house and stuff. Are they closely related or are they, is mm-hmm. the name just similar? Uh, no, they're actually quite closely related. There's a bunch of different like clades mm-hmm. of Dusky Salamanders. Um, and there's the, the Acrophius clade which contains a lot of like the little montane ones, but it also includes the Southern Dusky Salamander. So Abditus um, and the Southern Dusky Salamander, um, what is it, Auriculatus, are actually pretty closely related. Um, doing a phylogenetic tree for them, they fall out pretty close to each other. Um, mm. And it's the same sort of thing, like Southern Dusky Salamanders exhibit that really specific habitat preference. They like those little seeps, um, which is, you know, I've never found one. I've tried a few times and, and failed a few times. Um, but it's a cool species to, and I'd really like to find one. You should go to that? my house back home. We, My house back home, I, that's like the only salamanders I ever find are slimy salamanders, southern duskies, and a few red salamanders. And I, I've caught a few spotted, but really it's southern dusky spotted and reds. Mm-hmm. Um, or in, t- in two, three line t- um, salamanders too. A lot of those, but yeah, I find a lot of southern duskies at my house though, in Georgia. <laughs> it's pretty neat. I mean, that sounds like a good time to me. Uh, when's the invite? <laughs> <laughs> Whenever you want. I mean, I, I live in Florida now, but but I see it'll be on the other side of the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely anytime between now and June, I'd totally be down to go and look for some. All right. All right. I've been meaning to make my way back east for a couple of years now, and so I'm, I'm, I miss popping around Georgia and Florida and Tennessee. Um, so a trip is in order for sure. Awesome, cool. Um, so uh, something you mentioned and you kind of like touched on it a little bit later, but you were talking about how um, you just had that first like positive reaction with um, reptiles when you were a kid and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and th- that's something interesting. So a lot of people say um, that humans are naturally afraid of snakes. And for the longest time, I disagreed with that. I always thought it was people just get their first interaction is usually a negative interaction. Like your mother, when you're a kid, you know, you're first learning what's what's good and what's bad. So if your mother or someone tells you like, no, don't get near that snake, mm-hmm. it forms in your mind that that's bad stuff. Um, looking at more research, I've, I'm pretty sure it it actually is like built in for us Mm -hmm. to be afraid of snakes but i'm interested in your thoughts of what you think of how that first positive interaction can override that that natural instinct we have Mm -hmm. to be afraid of i think you're you're absolutely right that it it can be overridden so there is a there is a definite like evolutionary history for primates to be afraid of snakes um and that's been tested and proved all the time. But if there's anything that humans are good at, it's kind of overcoming our, our evolutionary programming. We do it all the time. Um, we do it with like the foods we eat, some of the behaviors like we, or some of the behaviors we exhibit. We're really good at, at overcoming certain types of evolutionary programming. And I think that especially interactions when you're young, can sort of dictate some of the paths that your your life takes and you're exactly right about you know parents saying like oh don't touch that snake um can kind of lead to uh, an increased fear or increased hatred of of snakes later on in life i mean how many people how many kids is their first interaction with a snake like their uncle cutting the head off a garter snake or something with a shovel and telling them that it's dangerous and to never pick it up um and especially if that happens at a young age when, you know, kids are impressionable, then that's what they grow up thinking the relationship with snakes is like. Um, but in my case, and in the case of a lot of different herpetologists, I, I've had this conversation at conferences and stuff with people many, many times. And if you talk to a bunch of herpers or a bunch of herpetologists and you ask them, like, what was your first interaction with a snake? overwhelmingly it's usually positive it's hard to find a a herper or herpetologist whose first interaction with a with a snake was something bad was something negative and 
I think if you can learn from a young age that yes, snakes can be dangerous and they need to be given respect, but that doesn't respect doesn't have to equal hatred in that, in that case. Um, and if you teach respect and, you know, admiration from a young age, I think you're going to get a person who likes snakes, even if they don't go on to work with them or they don't even go on to be a herper or anything, you know, they just have a, a healthy respect for them. Yep. Um, that, I, don't, I don't know what Nate's specific um, uh, first interaction was. Mine's kind of unique, though, because I never really had I didn't really have a positive one, but it wasn't negative either. It's kind of weird. Like the first interaction, I was a little kid. My brother stepped on a garter snake when he walked out of the house and like freaked hmm. out and screamed and stuff. But no one was like, he, he like freaked out, but it, I like it didn't, it wasn't like, you know, don't touch that or anything like that. And then we, um, I remember uh, like maybe a couple of years later, I was, I was, I don't know, like five or six, um, a snake was in our garage when we came home and my mom hmm told us not to go anywhere near it and she called the neighbor over and he went and killed it with a shovel and stuff yeah. but i was all but i remember being drawn to it because i really wanted to go like see it and stuff and um my mom wouldn't let me and stuff and when it was dead i finally walked up there and saw it and stuff but i i, I was always drawn to them like which is mm -hmm. weird even though i never had like and yeah i never had like a positive reaction but i think i think it was because i never really had a negative one and then i had a love for biology and it kind of just melded together mm -hmm. as as a so I don't know. It's kind of weird, but yeah, I think yeah. you're exactly right. The, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I'm no, I'm no childhood psychologist, but I, I imagine, <laughs> you know, see, seeing your, your brother step on it, but then not having, you know, somebody tell you afterwards with that specific interaction that like, Oh, it was evil or anything. It probably just like, you know, got you curious from a young yeah. age. And so even then, you know, when the next interaction was somebody, somebody killing it, you know, you were still just overcome with that curiosity, I would guess. But, you know, like I said, I'm definitely not a childhood psychologist. I think so. I'm also, like, drawn to things that are supposed to be dangerous. <laughs> I am, too. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, so, and then, yeah, and then with that love for biology, it just turned into more, like like you said, a healthy respect for, for, the, for the animals. Mm -hmm. um, what about you, Nate? Was your first interaction pretty positive, or...? That's going back a ways. It's getting kind of murky. I can't remember if it was just some <laughs> random garter snake in my backyard or when we were out canoeing and we saw this big, giant northern water snake on the side of the creek, on the side of the riverbank, and my dad just splashed it with the paddle and darted off. That's about as early as I can remember. So, hmm. Interesting. That is, that's interesting, though, that, uh, that you said that, that a lot of herpers, their first interaction is positive. I bet you that's true. I also found that a lot of um, herpetologists and stuff, um, they had an early love for dinosaurs. Um, oh, yeah. Is that the same for you? Uh, absolutely. When I was uh, a little kid, I loved dinosaurs. I guess I, I still love dinosaurs. They're awesome yeah. and incredible. Um, but growing up, especially, you know, I, I was born in 1994. Um, and so Jurassic Park came out when I was born and i think i watched it as like a real as a really little kid um and as soon as i saw jurassic park i was like oh i want to be a paleontologist and then at some point down the line i learned that jurassic park wasn't real and that <laughs> dinosaurs didn't or weren't still alive they didn't exist um and i think from there my my attention kind of focused on you know living things i wanted something i could hold i wanted something i could go see in the wild um but yeah, I loved dinosaurs as a little kid. I, I still do. Um, and so you're, um, you are uh, working on your um, master's right now? I'm working on my PhD. PhD, okay, okay. And what, um, what, what are you specifically looking into for your PhD? My PhD specifically is looking at the effects of wildfire, both uh a pretty recent wildfire that happened in 2019 and um, historical wildfires that I have data for and seeing how the presence or absence of fire affects the behavior, the diet, the natural history, the body condition of rattlesnakes, uh, specifically in like the Madrian sky Island region of 
southwestern New Mexico and southeastern Arizona. Um, this is an area that's really prone to fires, but has had fire suppression for a long time. It's also got a really interesting evolutionary history of rattlesnakes. There's a bunch of different species that live up in those mountains with kind of weird biogeographical patterns. Um, and so it's, it's provided a, a pretty good little microcosm for studying how fire affects rattlesnakes. Cause you can go to one mountain range or one spot in a mountain range and be like, Oh, this burnt last year. Let's catch a bunch of snakes here and see what it's like versus another spot where it's like, Oh, this hasn't burned in 60 years. And it's, it's, you know, all overgrown or something, or maybe this area has had a really healthy fire history and it's had good fires and it's been what either well managed or allowed to follow a natural uh, fire regime. And so I'm just looking at the ways that that's affected snakes. Um, yeah. Have you, um, have you, have you gotten the impression that fires are uh, like a good thing at like bringing, like, I don't know, kind of resetting things and, and bringing new life into the area or, or would you say it's more detrimental for snakes? Yes and no to both of those. Um, okay. One of the interesting things and one of the problems with studying fire is that fires can be incredibly different from each other. Um, and what I'm finding is that it's not necessarily the effects of a single fire, but rather the effects of the fire regime that has been present on that landscape for a long time. Um, so if you have an area that's been allowed to burn and it has a healthy fire regime, then when a fire moves through, the, the habitat is ready for it. And it um, and that individual fire doesn't really affect the snakes that much. There might be a little bit of mortality, but they're not losing habitat or anything. Um, and the usual, where, where there's been a, a healthy fire regime, the fires themselves are usually better behaved. And so mortality is lower because, mm. you know, it's a pretty reasonable fire. Um, not like one of these crazy big wildfires. Yeah. But on the other side of that, in places, in mountain ranges where you have had fire suppression and you've had a buildup of fuel, you've had, um, you know, undergrowth growing up and then you get a fire in a place where fire has been excluded for like 60 years uh oftentimes what you'll get is these big stand replacing fires that will take out all the mature trees um take out all the understory and that can be really really destructive um and it can kill more individual snakes as well as following the fire um they don't have their preferred habitat. Uh, there's usually a lot of erosion. Um, and so plants have a harder time coming back. Um, and so what we find is that places where forests have been mismanaged in relation to fire, um, when fire does come, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's angry, I guess. Um, <laughs> those fires are really destructive and can have a hard impact on uh, some snakes. That being said, you know, not all snakes are the same. Um, some of them are incredibly generalist. Uh, and if a fire moves through, replaces all the trees and replaces it with like scrubby grassland, uh, you know, Western dimeback rattlesnake loves that. Uh, and so they'll start moving in and you'll get a kind of replacement of the, the snake community that you see there. Whereas, you know, something that has really specific habitat preferences um, in a more specific diet, like a, a ridge nose rattlesnake or something. If you have fire exclusion and then a big stand replacing fire and it, you know, takes out all the mature trees, um, they can have a hard time bouncing back after something like that. Once. Uh, so is there any particular species out there that you maybe not focus on, but more or less target more than others when you're looking for them? So my research is on every species of rattlesnake that I can find out there. Um, but I would say I specifically focus mostly on banded rock rattlesnakes, Crotalus lepidus clobberi, and blacktail rattlesnakes, um, Crotalus molossus. Mostly because those are the two most common species in the ranges where I'm working. Uh, and they provide kind of a really good 
study pair. Um, black tails are larger bodied, um, more generalist. You can find them in all sorts of habitats. They can move vast different or mass distances. Uh, whereas rock rattlesnakes have more specific habitat preferences, more specific diets, and, you know, they are less able to move to new habitats um, if there's been a change to their habitat. Um, once a fire is started, mm -hmm. do, do you, and you may not know the answer to this, but do are animals able to sense that and move um, move out of the move out of the way, kind of like an elephant can detect an earthquake? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, animals are are really sensitive to to fire um i used to work in in florida as a prescribed fire technician and like as soon as the fire was lit if you kept your eyes open you would see animals moving away from the burn and a lot of times you'd see like yeah. snakes and stuff um you know i found diamondbacks moving away from the burn i found you know cotton mouths all sorts of like racers and rat snakes and stuff um so if you think about it, you know, snakes have this incredibly advanced sense of smell, sense of taste using their tongue. Mm -hmm. um, they can, they, they can pick up smoke particles in the air and detect a fire way before humans can. And humans are really good at smelling and detecting smoke. And for most snakes, what they would do is if they smell smoke, you know, most snakes are hanging out near like a den or just a, a refuge that they know um, they'll smell smoke and then just go down into the rocks or something and wait it out. And if it's like a healthy, good fire, you know, even if it burns right over their den, they will just weather it out um, and be all right, but they can absolutely detect it. So is most of mortality uh, coming from uh, if a fire moves like really quickly, like, like a wild, a big wildfire or something like that. And yeah, a big wildfire can, you know, move really, really fast and maybe catch a snake unawares. But also when you have a really big wildfire with um, with these really high temperatures, these stand replacing fires, um, sometimes like just the heat that is built up from this fire will like sterilize mm -hmm. the soil um, a foot down. And so if you have a snake that's like under a rock or under a big log or something, or even kind of down in a hole, um, if it was a small fire, it'd be all right. But if you have, you know, temperatures high enough to sterilize soil uh, a foot underneath the ground, um, then a snake in its den might not be, um, might not be safe, or it might feel that heat, get nervous and try and like leave or something during the middle of the fire, right. um, and then, you know, get caught outside in the fire. Um, but yeah, the bigger fires are, are definitely more dangerous, definitely more destructive. And animals seem to have a, a poor response to them when they're actually happening. So with these prescribed burns, when people do prescribed burns and stuff, um, mm -hmm. there's no like moving animals or out or anything. You, you set the fire, but you make sure it, it burns t so that there's little to no mortality like the the animals will know to leave and then the ones that stay in burrows and stuff is not going to affect them mm -hmm. yeah and there's certain ways that you can that you can kind of alleviate those symptoms a anytime a fire is set you you know have the the possibility of an animal getting caught in it and dying um yeah but in the end the benefit to that species from a, a habitat restorative fire is you know makes up for a lost individual but you can when you're setting the fire itself you can take steps to make sure that it's less harmful on animals like for one you don't ring an area in you know you burn from like one side and then allow the animals to like escape in a single direction if you ring them in then you know stuff might get trapped um you can also you burn on days when fire behavior is going to be less destructive enough to meet your objectives but if you go outside and it's you know 100 degrees outside and you know zero percent humidity you're not going to burn on that day um because the fire behavior is just going to be crazy and for one yeah. as like a prescribed 
as the person doing the prescribed burn um, on a day like that, it's really uh, dangerous and the fire could break out of containment and, you know, go burn a nearby forest and a bunch of homes and stuff. So you don't burn on those days. You burn on days when you think that fire behavior is going to be more mild, more manageable, and, you know, kind of clear out the forest without being super destructive. So I, I honestly don't know a whole ton about uh, prescribed burning, but I did hear, um, I heard in passing once watching something, I don't remember what it was, but the person seemed to suggest that um, they're, I don't remember the exact what, exactly what he said, but it kind of had the implication that prescribed burning was antiquated and that it it doesn't actually do as much good as we think it does. What are your What are your thoughts on that? I, have you heard anything like that? I, I had until I heard that, so I was curious. Hmm. So I, I don't know if I've specifically heard that. I've heard I've heard criticisms against prescribed burning for sure. Um, and I think one thing that we need to consider is that you know fire across the landscape, especially if you're looking at like the U S um, a fire in Florida is really different from like a, fl- a fire in Oregon or something, right, even right. if it's both prescribed burns. Um, I'm mostly familiar with burns in like sort of Eastern piney woods stuff. Um, you know, I, I was working and living in Florida, so we were burning longleaf pine and that sort of stuff. Um, and out there in some of those fire adapted ecosystems, it, you know, it was, it seemed to be fantastic for restoring forests um, as well, as long as it was done intelligently, it it didn't seem to be destructive. Um, I got to see some incredibly diverse and beautiful and well-managed habitats that had had fire on the landscape for, you know, 120 years and they were just thriving um, Mm. versus places where it was fire suppressed and you just had like, trees choked out by invasives you had no sunlight hitting the forest floor um you know diversity was one tenth of what it was in those well-managed forests um now if you go out west prescribed fire for one isn't done that often um but it also you know has different implications you have different objectives for a big western fire or western prescribed fire and a lot of research has been done on prescribed fire um, in the Eastern United States. Um, we're still getting all of the research and all of the data for how prescribed fire works uh, in the Western United States. But what we do know is that there is a natural fire regime to every single environment in the U S right. um, even like the Arctic tundra has a fire regime. It's just, you know, fires on like a 50 to 100 year uh, timeline. But we're, we're still figuring that out. And fire is important on every single landscape to some extent. And it's just it's just figuring that out and trying to burn in a way that replicates the natural fire regime that we suppressed for, you know, the past 200, 300 years, depending on where you are in the country. That's really interesting. So I never thought about it like that. So it's it's basically the prescribed burnings are um, uh, trying to fulfill what would naturally already occur. But if it's not, it's kind of helping that mm-hmm. go on. That's really interesting. Yeah. Also, you said something else that I didn't think of, um, how prescribed burnings affect um, invasive plants and stuff. So mm-hmm. those really help get rid of invasive plants because I guess they're burning them away. And so the invasive plant would have to reestablish itself back in the area. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's that's not true for every species of invasive. There are some species of invasive plants that love fire, um, mm-hmm. that they themselves are fire adapted in their own ecosystems. And if you burn, then they just come back like crazy. And so you have to do like more hands on cutting management sort of stuff. But for a lot of species, um, fire is a really useful tool for um, for managing invasives. And that's both non-native invasives, you know, so stuff that comes over from like Asia or South America, uh, but it also includes like native species that uh, will will just get too 
prolific if there's no fire on an ecosystem. Uh, I work a lot right now in the east, like the sort of central east central Texas piney woods, kind of lost pines region. Um, mm -hmm. And Yopon holly is a species that is native to this area, but with fire suppression, it just it chokes out the understory. Uh, it chokes out smaller trees, so there's no regeneration. And if fire is removed from a landscape, this native species just goes crazy. But then, you know, if you burn, you can restore the landscape in regards to that species. Uh, and that's true all over the place. Um, so why are you specifically looking at uh, rattlesnakes as opposed to like something else for, for um, burning fires? Yeah. Um, a couple different reasons. One, personally, I just, I really like rattlesnakes. Um, yeah. They're, they're awesome. And part of that goes back to, you know, when I was little, I went to um, a talk that Dave Barker gave and he did his masters on rattlesnakes in the, like the borderland region of New Mexico, Arizona and Mexico. Um, and I remember sitting in that talk and, and like listening to him and he was just like showing photos of his field work. And as a little kid, I like pointed at the screen and was like, I'm going to do that. I want to do that so bad. Um, and so when I, I came to grad school, I was originally doing some other fire related work, um, but in the sort of East Texas Lost Pines eco region. Um, and it just, it, it wasn't super interesting to me. I probably, I could have gotten a good project out of it, but it, it I, I wasn't really passionate about it. Um, and then I was, I was out West and while I was there, there was a fire. And as soon as I got home, I went to my boss and I said, you know, there's a fire out here in the mountains. This is the right time to do a follow-up project on some fire related rattlesnake research that, uh, Andrew Holy Cross did, um, for his PhD. And I, I made a case for it and I pushed really, really hard for it. Uh, and I made it happen. Um, I should also say that even before I was researching rattlesnakes, I was, you know, spending as much of my free time as possible going out to New Mexico and Arizona and West Texas and specifically looking for rattlesnakes. Um, mm. Just something about them has, has grabbed me ever since I was, ever since I was a kid, um, specifically rock rattlesnakes. I, I love them so much. I, I love their variation. I love their cryptic coloration. I, I love where they live. I love how you find them. Um, they just, have been on my mind ever since I was a little kid and I saw the opportunity to do a project on them and I I jumped at it and I pushed for it and thankfully it seems to have worked. Awesome. awesome. So, so you, uh, how what are some of the things you've kind of noticed uh, with your research out there in the Sky Islands? Yeah, so yeah, a lot of my data is still preliminary, uh, but there's a few trends that I have been able to see. Um, for one, and this sort of is the backbone to most of the rest of my research, um, is that I've been able to see a difference in the plant communities between burned and unburned areas. And changes in those plant communities um, has been affecting some of the habitat preferences and body condition of snakes. So some of it is like kind of what we would expect. Uh, we're finding that black tail rattlesnakes are more likely to choose habitat areas with more adult trees, regardless of what the uh, species of trees are, but they like sort of more forested canyons. Um, and then in relation to fire is if you have a fire roll through that's big and destructive, which is some of the areas that my specific study fire burnt. Um, some areas that were forested have now been converted to grassland, and it seems to be a little bit less preferred by blacktail rattlesnakes, but a little bit more preferred by western dimeback rattlesnakes. So we can see uh, 
this sort of the beginnings of a change in uh, species community uh, where diamondbacks are kind of moving up into the mountains now that the mountains are being converted more to grasslands, whereas the blacktails seem to prefer it a little bit less. Um, then you see sort of similar stuff for rock rattlesnakes. Um, rock rattlesnakes really like rock piles with like bushes and trees growing around them because um, that attracts lizards or that attracts bugs, which then attracts lizards and, you know, more prey. And so what we've been seeing a little bit of so far is that where you've had these burns that have kind of taken out more adult trees, where they grow around rocks, seems to be a little bit less preferred by, um, by rock rattlesnakes. And that's all in terms of habitat preference. Another big thing that I've been looking at is body condition, using some statistical methods to sort of determine the health of an individual snake relative to the, the rest of the population. And what we can see is that um, sorry, I'm trying to trying to think of my results here so I can accurately portray them. Um, yeah. We're seeing a, oh wait, actually. I don't even need to think about it. I have, I have the data here. <laughs> All right, so what we can see is that um, Crotalus molossus, blacktail rattlesnakes, they have decreasing body condition as vegetation height goes down. Um, so again, this correlates to, you know, less trees, less bushes as it's sort of burnt down to lower grass. Uh, they seem to have declining body condition as that happens. Specifically, why that, you know, affects their body condition the way it does, I'm not exactly sure yet. Um, what we found for uh, modeled or banded rock rattlesnakes is that the amount of litter in a, a transect or the amount of litter surrounding its habitat. Um, and that can be like grass litter or oak litter, pine litter, uh, things that are burnt off in fires. Um, where there's more of that, they seem to be in better body condition. Maybe that correlates to, you know, there's more inverts using that leaf litter layer, which then attracts lizards or, you know, um, banded rock rattlesnakes love to eat centipedes. So maybe that brings more centipedes around, uh, affects the food chain. But what we can see is that places where the fires were healthier, um, the snakes seem to be kind of doing fine, but where the effects of the fire were greater and replaced some of that litter layer and that vegetation, um, we're, we're starting to see a little bit decreased, uh, decreased body condition. And then the most significant result that I have is not surprising at all, but it's banded rock rattlesnakes uh, tend to be healthier and tend to prefer habitats uh, with more rocks. So they are, they are well-named. Um, <laughs> so uh, back to the blacktails, mm -hmm. it'd be kind of interesting to like, uh, take some blood work on them, see if like a, maybe with uh, habitats with less overhead cover, they have like, I don't know, maybe heightened cortisol levels or you know, heightened stress mm -hmm. that might play a role in their decreased body shape. It absolutely could. Um, so I've, I've been taking a lot of blood uh, from the snakes. I haven't done um, hormone analysis to look for cortisol yet, but it's, it's one of the many things on my to-do list. Um, uh, but that kind of goes, um, goes towards a, something that was noted at in a paper a few years ago. I think it was one of Dave Barker's papers, um, but showed that for rattlesnakes, um, areas that had had a really big destructive post or um, stand replacement fire um, predation levels were higher on snakes in those areas specifically from birds of prey um, 
so areas with no vegetation if it's bare ground that's just been yeah. burnt out um hawks eagles kestrels all that stuff they they love that and they just they can absolutely hunt snakes um better than they would in an area that had either not been burned or been burned um with a, a healthy fire so i imagine snakes blacktail rattlesnakes that are in areas with less vegetation are probably a little bit more stressed because they have higher rates of predation um, against them in those areas. Um, oh, okay. That's interesting. So they might have more, there's higher rates of predation. So there might be more stress that leads to decline in body. That's interesting. Um, so some of the more practical applications of the research is this, would would it be more into um, like how to perform prescribed burning or would it be more into what to do after like a big wildfire has cut down a lot of like vegetation and stuff? I would say more for prescribed burning. Um, they are, the forest service is, is now on track to start doing more prescribed burns uh, out in this region. Um, in fact, they've already done a few of them, but we need this sort of data to be able to like figure out when to do a fire, what kind, what our objectives are. Are we trying to, you know, replace forest and bring back grasslands in some places, or are we trying to, you know, burn real low and slow and just remove some of the undergrowth and keep these mm. forests? Um, because if, you know, if we don't know exactly what our objectives are in relation to conservation, then, you know, they might think like, Oh, we need to get rid of some pines or something here. And then they burn on a day that they know is going to kill some pines or something. And that might end up being negative um, in the long run for conservation. So just knowing when to set these fires, knowing like what kind of post burn objectives we're looking for, um, can be really useful, especially when you're looking at like some threatened or endangered species in the area. Are there um, species? Uh, um, I can't think of the word, but going out and finding specific species before prescribed burn. So like you want to do a prescribed burn, but maybe the area needs more of the undergrowth burnt mm -hmm. out. Is there like looking for species where that would... Uh, yeah, if there's a large amount of species there that where the undergrowth, burning out the undergrowth will lead to um, poor effects. Is, is there like, does that go on? If that makes sense. I know that was a really poorly worded question, but. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I think that like pre-fire surveys. Um, yeah, that was the word. Like like a, a yeah, pre-fire surveys from a, both a biology perspective and like a forestry perspective should absolutely be performed almost any time a prescribed fire is being done. Maybe not every time. Cause you know, if you have somewhere like where I worked in Florida, you know, that's been burned regularly for like 60 years, you know, they don't need to go do a survey every time they're about to burn. But if you're about to set the first prescribed fire in a mountain range, that's been fire suppressed for a long time. And you're trying to figure out what your objectives are. I, sending people in there beforehand to look for endangered species or just to get a feel of the landscape is, I, I would say, is absolutely critical. Um, you know, you can't you can't manage a, a piece of land if you don't know what's going on, if you don't know what's there. Right. Um, now, I understand maybe why they wouldn't do that as much because a lot of these landscapes are big, rugged, hard to hike in and hard to survey. And, you know, if you've got the forestry service, you know, they might just want to kind of get it done and then move on to something else. But I, I think that pre-fire and post-fire surveys are essential for, for proper management. So uh, with your research in rattlesnakes, have you noticed any like uh, populations like either increasing or decreasing hmm. or have or is it kind of a little too early to tell in those ecosystems? I would say, I would say it's, a it's a little bit too early to tell for most things, um, except for uh, mountain range where I work in, 
we are definitely seeing an increase in uh, Western diamondback rattlesnakes at higher elevations. Um, they, they seem to be kind of moving up out of the lowlands and now are being found in places where, you know, people did not regularly find them 30 years ago. Um, I'm also, so I work with the New Mexico originos rattlesnake, Crotalus willardi obscurus. Um, and that species has absolutely declined like crazy uh, over the past couple decades. Um, whether that's a factor of just climate change kind of disrupting monsoon seasons or, you know, the cumulative effects of a couple really bad fires over the years, it's still hard to say. But with that species specifically, which is, you know, the only rattlesnake on the endangered species list, it has absolutely declined um, in a really depressing way. So um, with the, the New Mexico version of the rattlesnake, uh, are they like, do they have like a really specific small type of habitat, rare type of habitat that mm -hmm. they specialize in? And, or is it maybe just some other factor that kind of contributes to their low numbers? So they, they do have really specific habitat. They like mature pine trees and well shaded, well wooded canyons. Um, which is the habitat that is exactly, you know, what gets destroyed by a big stand replacing fire. Um, little like wooded canyons like that, when there's a big fire that, you know, gets up into the crowns of trees, it, you know, radiates heat off the sides of, of the canyons and it gets really hot in there. And I, I've seen spots where there used to be, you know, old growth pine forests, um, one week and then there's a fire in the next week there's not a single standing pine left alive um wow. and you know some of those trees are 150 200 years old and to get back to that mature old growth forest type it it takes a really really long time and that time might not be time that the species has unfortunately yeah it seems that most species that specialize in old growth habitats usually tend to suffer the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, you know, you get, I don't know, effects of like competition and stuff um, with that species specifically, if it gets more arid and there's less trees and, you know, erosion, you know, post fire washes all the dirt away and you're left with just like a really kind of rocky scrubby habitat. Um, banded rock rattlesnakes love that. Uh, they move right into that and might sort of outcompete, push out Riginose rattlesnakes. Um, or if you have like Aatrox, the Western Diamondbacks coming up um, into the mountain ranges a little bit more, they probably would outcompete them. Um, it just, it seems to be, you know, a whole suite of factors kind of coming in from all sides, unfortunately. These, um, species that specialize in old growth um mm -hmm. are they is there anything you can do so like if an old forest like that old growth goes goes out is there anything mm -hmm. you can do with um helping them survive or is it better in to try and focus on preventing that fire from happening in the first place i would say of course you know the prevention of destructive fires is the best way to go um, there's been some talk about like reforestation uh, tree planting efforts post fire, um, especially with some of those slow growing pines um, to just get in there and start planting trees after a fire. Um, so that way maybe the effects are the, mm -hmm. the negative effects don't last as long, but yeah. w without a doubt, you know, prevention is the best medicine. Um, so you talked about, um, you, uh, Nate, did you have a question on that? Cause I was going to change gears here for a second. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, 
Um, so you, okay, so you mentioned before one of the things that attracts you to rattlesnakes is uh, rattlesnake intelligence. You mm -hmm. want to kind of talk about that and what um, the intelligence intelligence you see in them? Yeah. Um, so to, to cite not my own research, um, there was a study done a few years ago about like sociality in Arizona black rattlesnakes. That was absolutely. Um, fantastic and let me i just want to make sure that i'm uh giving shout outs to the to the right people um yeah um ooh, come on scroll down Uh, Melissa Amarello did a, a fantastic study on Crotalus Cerberus um, and showed that these snakes were, you know, for one, denning up together in these big sort of communal dens, but then we're showing like, for one, incredible parental behavior, um, and two, like, relationships essentially outside of family bonds like snakes spending time with each other despite not being related to each other um the shared like care of young outside of you know blood relation which i think is just in incredible like That's incredible, essentially yeah. in the study they found that like essentially snakes have best friends they have other individuals that they prefer to spend time with and like bask with um outside of blood relation which you know the general public thinks that snakes are dumb and that yeah. snakes are just like mindless venomous killers and what we're finding is the exact opposite is that they're actually intelligent they're able to distinguish individuals of their same species at least um and going out there and working with them out in the wild, you know, I haven't seen that specifically. I haven't seen snakes have best friends, but when you're dealing with a rattlesnake, like it's not just, you know, like a dumb animal kind of lashing out and striking at you. Like they, they watch you, they know what's going on. And, you know, at this point I've worked with and handled a whole bunch of rattlesnakes. And personally, I found that if you, if you don't come at them like a threat, if you don't come at them like a predator, um, which, you know, is in your behavior, it's in like the way that you grab them. If you're using tongs, like you grab them right behind the neck or something, um, that's a very predatory thing to do. Essentially, if you're chill with them, they're chill with you. And they yeah. will very quickly realize like, okay, this guy, this big dumb monkey is annoying <laughs> and he's messing with me, but he's not, he's not trying to eat me, you know, he wants something else. Um, but they, they seem to be able to tell the difference between, you know, a predation event against them or a possible predation event against them and just someone or something messing with them. Um, which I think is really, really cool because a lot of people think that like, Oh, you know, as soon as you see a snake, it's just like mean and aggressive and it's, it's trying to get you, it's trying to attack you and stuff. Um, but in reality, if you're respectful to them, they're really respectful to you. Um, and so that's been something that's just struck me about the intelligence of them. Cause you know, a whole lot of other animals like don't seem to, to get that, you know, they see a human as a predator and that's, that's all they'll do. Um, other than that, like, and this is pretty anecdotal, um, yeah. but rock rattlesnakes banded rock rattlesnakes i seem to always find them together um not just in pairs but like two individuals or multiple individuals near each other um that's like the greatest tip that i can give to to someone if they're going out and trying to find rock rattlesnakes if you find one start looking around in just like consecutive circles because there's probably another one within like five feet um but they just, they seem to spend time together. Um, not necessarily males, because, you know, males will get territorial and, like, you know, fight with each other. But females definitely seem to be spending time together 
um, or at least using the same habitats. And I'm sure that there's some sort of benefit to, you know, posting up near another established female if you're an, uh, a female rock rattlesnake. I don't know exactly what it is, but they seem to always be doing it. Um, now, maybe it's just because that habitat is better. Um, hold on one second. My, my dog has grabbed a, a chew toy. Uh, that's probably going to be not very good for podcast audio. Um, <laughs> um, but I don't know. It's just like little stuff like that. If, if you work with the species for long enough uh, and you spend a lot of time with them, they, they seem smart. I don't really know how else, how else to put it. Has, to your knowledge, has there been any studies um, looking at if there's like a higher survivability with um, rattlesnakes that form more social bonds or are more social or have more social behavior? Um, or is it, has it, is it more neutral, the social behavior on, on their survivability? I think that'd be something really interesting to look into. Yeah, I can't think of like a specific study, but I know some work has been done that's shown that um, for some species, communal um, denning for one, like overwintering and stuff yeah. um, is more beneficial for those yeah. species than if one of those species was, you know, by itself. Um, and I've, I've, there's some paper about um, like not nesting, but um like rattlesnake rookeries raising young uh, around others um you know all go into the same rock pile or something whether it's like timber rattlesnakes or banded rock rattlesnakes or something um i think has been shown to have higher um survival for the young themselves um so it might not be like a thing like oh all species do better when they're near each other but for the species that display some sort of communal or social behavior they do better with that um they do better when they're more social than if they're trying to go it alone uh, at least in those two specific regards so let me let me ask you something this. so animal intelligence is something i'm super interested in especially right like right now mm -hmm. um and so a lot of so like for instance like with wolves dogs those kind of things when they're the pack they they form packs and like a lot of dogs will form packs with their human companions and stuff they see it as a pack and so when they're um because when they're in a pack they have a higher survivability right because there's there's well for a lot of different reasons so part of that is because it's hardwired in their brain because it increases survivability so i've always wondered like if an animal formed was very social and formed a lot of um uh connections relationships that way but without because like so some people say animals aren't uh intelligence or uh conscious um mm -hmm. you could argue that the only reason animals act empathetic in any way is to is is because it increases survivability so it's hardwired and it's not actually empathy if that makes sense mm -hmm. or simply i've heard those two defined differently um mm -hmm. so if you could take like an animal that forms social packs but it's not to increase survivability like what, what are your thoughts on that like for instance like water monitors or monitors a lot of monitors tend to be more solitary that i'm aware of if mm -hmm. they if they form if you could find one acting what would be empathetic towards another that would be mm -hmm. kind of i guess evidence for more conscious or intelligent behavior what are your thoughts on that well so i would say for one there's probably a lot of instances of like where you see animals together they are um you know they're just congregating around resources or something a good watering hole is going to have a bunch of a bunch of water monitors yeah but what we're also finding specifically with water with monitors is that monitors are are wicked smart yeah, um, absolutely. Like, probably, I, I don't know if I can really back this up, but I, I I would say that monitors are in the running for, like, the smartest reptiles, um, probably right behind crocodilians or something. We've um, had that debate several times on here whether crocodilians or monitors are more intelligent. <laughs> I mean, uh, well, so, it's a certifiable fact. 
he 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 falls in the crocodilian camp. I'm more in the monitor camp, but I'm a monitor guy. So, <laughs> well, I I think that I don't know. What what do you mean when you when you say in intelligence? Yeah. Um, there there are a bunch of different types of of intelligence, um, and I think for a long time science human perception of animals has been skewed because whenever we're trying to rank the intelligence of an animal we think like oh how how human is it how human does it act Mm -hmm. um because that's how we rank intelligence but in reality there's you know there's a bunch of different types of intelligences humans are very like problem solving specifically tool oriented um intelligence but like i don't know something like a a dolphin or a killer whale has an incredible social intelligence and i I think probably the one of the big trends in biology um specific specifically as it relates to animal intelligence is that we're constantly underestimating it um i read a book recently called metazoa by peter godfrey smith who it's all about the evolution of intelligence and you know for years and years and years we were thinking that like even these lower classification animals that we thought were like dumb and basically unaware of everything that's going on around them like um he talks about shrimp you know people were like oh shrimp don't feel pain they're not aware they're hardly even like classifiable as as conscious but then further research has shown that like oh they do feel pain they are fairly conscious they seem to recognize other individuals of their species they you know i don't know it constantly we're finding out that everything is smarter than we thought it was it's just that you know smart is a really broad term yeah that's one thing i've found is no one really has there's not really a set definition of what intelligence is and Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of more of you can have social intelligence and you can have um like problem solvability and stuff and then it's just kind of like how much of each one is like an an homologate an an homologation of just all that together and but yeah yeah every everything we try every time we try and really kind of study almost anything with uh any animal we always tend to anthropomorphize compare it to us Mm -hmm. which i think in some cases is apt because the only way we can see it is through our eyes you know you mm-hmm. can't really see it through but with intelligence i think you're right i think it's something i don't know it's 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 a pretty difficult question that's why i'm really interested in it right now because it's, it's a super interesting difficult question to answer no I'm, I'm with you this is one of my my favorite questions i mean i know i showed up here to, to talk about rattlesnakes but animal intelligence i i find incredibly interesting um I, i've been recently reading a whole lot about sperm whales um which for one have like the largest brains of any animal on earth. And for years we were like, Oh yeah, they're smart, but like they're not human smart. And then people are finding out that like they, they essentially have a language. Like they, um, they can produce something like 1500 different individual sounds. And when we start recording them, we're finding out that like, Oh, they're like, you know, they can make like 500 sounds a second. And they are just like, they're just like talking with each other and they're like repeating things back at each other and like using phrases and they're, they're speaking with a language that seems to be more complicated than anything that humans do by like an order of magnitude, you know, like the English alphabet has 26 characters, 26 different sounds that we've done to make our whole, you know, Let's incredibly run. variable English language. Well, their alphabet has 1500 letters. Um, and they're just talking to each other constantly because they can, you know, hear each other from 200 miles away or something. Um, and so I, I think over and over and over, yeah, we humans are smart, but I, I don't think we're the only ones. Um, I think animals are all smarter than we think that they are. Dolphins will um, imprint a name on, on their young, on their calves. And then every time they speak, they start by saying their name. And then whatever it is this, they were trying to say, and then end with saying their name again, which I think is incredible. And yeah, so like, I think sperm whales do the same thing. 
Yeah, and so um, so I do um, one of the side things I do is kayak tours and stuff, and I'll do dolphin tours and, and sometimes as well. Mm-hmm. And it's really cool because when we're doing the dolphin tours and we have um, uh, the engines going and stuff, each one has a unique pitch. So the captains will do specific noises, and the dolphins can recognize who's captain huh. at that time, which is really cool. And they'll do different. It's it's just incredible because they're the resident dolphins. They they mm-hmm. never leave the area, so. It's just it's incredible how to watch the how intelligent these animals are. Oh yeah. Um, the other interesting thing I've also found with this is depending on the scientific discipline you're talking to, um, mm-hmm. they define intelligence differently. So like I find like biologists a lot of times look at it on brain size compared to body weight, and you can draw. Mm-hmm. So if you plot that on a graph, draw a line of best fit animals above that line tend to be more intelligent like apes and, and stuff like that monitor lizards mm-hmm. corvids um but like uh psychologists a lot of times well they think every psychologist has a different opinion but, but mm-hmm. um they kind of see it more on like the um the uh like they they tend to view the iq test as a really good um and so they see it more of like your ability to do complex tasks Mm-hmm. And so they see more from a problem solving perspective. And then um, I listened to a couple of geneticists that really interestingly see it more on the amount of genetic material and how much intelligent information that can get across. And there's a whole like thing that goes into that, which is really interesting. So mm-hmm. I think it's fascinating I mean, that we can't even agree, you know? Yeah. I mean, absolutely. If you look at like different types of intelligences, you know, say you had, you know, humans in a room and you tell them to like change the light bulb and you know some of them invent a ladder to you know go up there and change the light bulb um whereas other than like another group of humans plans you know a a way to like lift someone up to do it um like which is more intelligent they both do the same thing probably with similar amounts of effort but like one is tool building versus one is social um they're different right. intelligences, but which one is smarter? Um, but granted, a lot of people would probably have some, you know, strong opinions about that. Would say like, oh, tool building is smarter or something. But I, I don't know if I agree. Um, I think smart is smart, and there's a a bunch of different pathways to get there. Yeah, I mean, like for instance, off that example, say someone's tool building and, and the other is more social, and you would, yeah. So a lot of people would naturally think the tool building is more smarter, but if the social aspect what if that's more efficient mm-hmm. Then, like it en- ends up being that that tends to be more often than not more efficient than the tool building. Like that mm-hmm. seems to be, that would be a good case for that being more, more of an intelligent avenue to go. So yeah, it's, there's so many ways to look at it. It's really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, one interesting thing I found out about sperm whales is they actually have like their own regional accents and different mm-hmm. languages per region as well. So Goes to show, I mean, you can't have a complex language without getting changed up by being separated from each other. Absolutely. Sperm whales are are, are so cool. Yeah. I mean, I know I'm a, a, a herp researcher, mm-hmm. but they I, I find them really fascinating. Sperm whales and orcas. Um yeah. you know. You can find me perusing their Wikipedia pages pretty often. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah. so I did listen to your episode with uh interview with uh andrew on the wildlife uh experience mm-hmm. and we did go and you know guys went to your uh controversial opinion about uh herping Wanna oh yes that? yeah yeah I'll, I'll i'll dive into it especially because i've had i've had some people message me since then um and so you know i've i've thought more about it since in the past couple days um and I think I want I, I want to just like start everything off with like my my only concern is is the conservation of the species. Um, so I guess what what my view is um, is that and in in that podcast when I was talking about it, um, I specifically used the example of uh, gray banded king snakes, Lampropeltis alterna, out in West Texas. Um, And I guess I'll stick with that because it's a pretty good case example. But you could also use the same argument for like modeled rock rattlesnakes out in West Texas or maybe subox. 
And I think, I think my uh, opinion is that the way that we are doing it right now is, or our relationship to it right now is bad conservation. Um, I am not saying that collection is, you know, destroying populations and that the species is going to go extinct or anything like that. Um, I think that there's probably some super localized effects that you could see, like, you know, oh, these cuts used to be super, super productive. Um, now they are not so, as much anymore. Um, but I think that that effect, it would be super, super localized. But I think what it, what my opinion boils down to is that we, in reality, we, we don't know what is going on with those populations. We do not have the data to say that we are having no effect. We don't have the data to say that the populations are, you know, increasing or declining or, or anything because we're not taking that data. Um, and what, what we have is kind of like a, an unregulated game species um, with, with no, with no bag limits, which here, actually give me a second. My dog's uh, chewing the bone on the floor and being real loud. Hey, come here, buddy. Come on, up here. All right, uh, all right, where was I? Um, yeah, so with something like a great banded king snake, um, you know, right now there's, there's no bag limits. Um, actually, I think technically there is, but they're not enforced at all. Yeah. Um, which may, maybe the species can handle that. Maybe it's fine. Maybe there's nothing humans could ever do to, you know, hurt that species, especially if, you know, just collecting from like roadways and stuff, but, you know, hunting without any sort of bag limits or any sort of regulation like that is just, it's bad conservation. Um, like I would challenge anybody to find me a conservation stress or a conservation success story of a species that is commonly collected from the wild where no data on capture um, numbers is taken or where bag limits are not enforced. Um, and so that, that's, that's my concern is I just want to take that data. I want to make sure make sure that these populations are as healthy as we assume that they are because human history has repeated stories of us saying like, Oh, there's no way we could affect this population. It's fine. We're never going to hurt this population. Look at, you know, bison, look at passenger pigeons, look at American alligators before they were protected. Look at, you know, egrets before the um, migratory bird act, all of these things where we said there's no way we could ever harm this population. You know, there's too many of them and we're just not doing that much. That seems to just lead to declines over and over and over. And so I am, uh, you know, I have no problems with, with collection of uh, reptiles or amphibians um, as long as it's done intelligently. Um, and we're willing to follow the data. I also, I, I'm a scientist. I love data. Um, and I, I just think about like the, the population data and stuff that we're leaving on the table. Um, you know, if you could get the data from every single collected Alterna or every single collected Lepidus in West Texas, that's an incredible sample size. Um, and it, it, you know, it gets me excited thinking about like what could be done with that, with that data. Um, a lot of good could be done with that data. And I think that in the end, doing that would help conserve the species that we all love and that we want to continue to have out there in the world. How would you go about like policing that or collecting that data? Like for instance, with fishing, like with limits, mm -hmm. um, a lot of times it's, if the marshal sees you or someone sees you bagging in way more, you know, but mm. a lot of times you can just get away with it unless someone sees mm. and reports or the marshal happens to, to catch you and stuff. What, what do you have any ideas on that? I mean, I, I would say something similar, you know, of course, like no sort of enforcement is ever going to be 100%. People could still right. get away with it. Um, right. But, you know, 
if you hunt, a, if you take a deer in Texas, even with a hunting license, you have to report it. You have to fill out your tag. Um, mm. And I, I think that you could easily do something similar. Like, okay, each person has a tag to collect like two pairs of of Lepidus or two pairs of Alterna a year and you fill out your tags in the same way that you do with ducks in the same way that you do with whitetail, you know, all over. And I think that what we've seen from the hunting community, and I, I should preface this by saying I'm, I'm not a hunter myself, um, but what we've seen is that the species that they do that with um, do really, really well. And they have the data to make intelligent conservation uh, decisions based off of that. Um, and herpers are notorious for not wanting any sort of regulation, any sort of oversight. Um, but I, I think that, I, th I think that's a risky move. Um, especially if we claim to love these species, if we claim to want to conserve them um, and want to make sure that they're still out there in a hundred years. I, I think that that's, you know, we need to start being smart about it. Mm. That's a, an unpopular opinion. I get that. Um, but I don't know. I, I just want to conserve these species. Yeah, I don't think any reasonable person will be opposed to there being like a bag limit on what you could take out. Mm. I think if I had to put a, place a finger on what the majority of people are hesitant about it, it would just be the involvement of the government, more or less. But, yeah, and... I, I think like, yeah, I think most people would probably not be upset about that um, because the majority of people like they go out to West Texas for a week or so, they find one or two Alterna, they're excited about it and they want to take it home. And that's absolutely fine. Um, but then you've got some other people who like go out to West Texas and bag every single animal that they find um, and then it gets sold on, you know, fauna classifieds are at a show uh, a month later and mm -hmm. that that's happening all the time you can I, I don't know when the next uh herb show is around here but you probably go to it and find you know texas wild caught animals um that were collected you know a few weeks or a few months before sitting there on the table um you know i've, I've seen like night snakes and long nose snakes alligator lizards all sorts of stuff and it's you know there are people who just go out there and, and grab everything and then try and sell it for cheap. Um, and I, 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 I'm not convinced that that's sustainable. Um, I, um, and I can certainly not so much, the, not the selling part, but I can certainly understand the, um, and I, I'm sure both of you too, but I, I, I certainly like feel for the, the people that, you know, go out herping in West Texas and want to take something and stuff because, like for years growing up, my mom, you know, didn't like reptiles. She never wanted me to have a pet reptile. So I would go out, I'd catch a reptile and I just, I'd keep it for a week or a month or so. And then I let it go again. And so for me, I just, I really love watching and observing reptiles and what they do. And so I still do that. Uh, I caught a green amoeba down here and I just let it run around on my porch for like a month. And I just, mm. I just loved observing what it did and how it behaved and stuff. And then I ended up letting that go and stuff. Um, so I, I've certainly been in that. Like we took a, me and Nate took a trip out herping in Utah where we caught these cool stuff and you want to like, you just, you want to see it more, you know, you don't want to mm. let it go. And, you know, you want to see, or at least for me, that's like, I want to observe it and see it more. And so there's that big temptation to take it back. Um and then you kind of have to, after a few days, you realize, all right, all right I should probably mm. not keep this and just let it go and stuff. And like you said, sometimes it's perfectly fine. But mm. um, anyways, I, 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 I totally feel for the, the position of wanting to, to take it and stuff. But you're absolutely right. Without bag limits, it's, it's not sustainable. Well, and I, I'll admit, like, I, I did the same exact thing growing up. You know, you would go into my room and I'd have, like, a whole bunch of anoles and rat snakes and stuff. And, and some of them I would keep for a while. Some of them I'd you know, release out again. And even like in West Texas, like, you know, when I first started going out there like that, that is the, the culture that was the culture It was, Oh, you found your first Alterna, like you keep it. And that, and with that snake comes like the memory of, you know, both finding the snake and, you know, the people you were with the, the trip that you took, it, it means something. And I, I understand that completely. 
it's not really my my mo anymore like now that i've done more biology work like i'm much more interested in seeing the the animal out in the wild Mm -hmm. um and then returning them to the wild afterwards but i understand that people feel differently uh, about it and what i really want is to make sure that these populations are you know sustainable and healthy enough that in you know 60 years or something my grandkid if he wants to hold on to a snake that he found for a couple months that there are still snakes for him to do that yeah um especially because you know globally the patterns of biodiversity biodiversity loss that we've seen are not optimistic um and i think we're approaching the point where we kind of have to choose what we want to save um and we kind of have to to manage and actively conserve everything if we want it to still be around um, in the future. And I, th- I think it's time that we start doing that more with reptiles and amphibians. A lot of people have assumed for a while that like reptiles and amphibians are like these, these lower order animals that you can basically do whatever you want to uh, to them and to their populations forever and ever and ever. Um, and it's fine. Oh, it's it's whatever. But I I don't think that's the case. Um, I think that they are in need of protection. Yeah. Yeah. When I do kayak tours, um, a lot of times I, people, common question, especially after I say that I I, um, do herpetology and stuff or I I work with reptiles, they, um, they, a lot of the most common question is, are there alligators here? And then are there snakes here? And um, when I talk about, so the, the area that we go, there's only one type of snake that's there. It's a salt marsh mangrove snake. And mm-hmm. I usually, I usually uh, tell them the type of snake and then I'll go in describing its behavior and, and what it looks like and all this other cool stuff. And you can tell they're really not interested. They just want to hear the end part of if it's venomous or not. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that's all they care about. They could care less about how the snake behaves or what it does or anything like that. Cause it's a really mm-hmm. fascinating snake. They just care if it's venomous or not. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's sad. It's uh, something that good conservation of reptiles isn't really going to happen until the public opinion kind of changes on it. Absolutely. And there's, you know, there, there's things that are changing that um, I talked about, like the, the social snakes earlier. Um, that's something that I found because every once in a while I'll do like, you know, local herp snake nature talks for like nature centers or master naturalist programs that sort of stuff um i think like you tell someone like oh rattlesnakes have best friends <laughs> like rattlesnakes are intelligent They're, and they take care of their young they're like oh i thought that this was just like a dumb scaly tube that slithered around and bit things and ate things and, and didn't care um but if you tell them like oh no like they have you know they they exhibit like more parental young than like or they they exhibit levels of parental young like equal with like you know a possum or a raccoon and and stuff you know they care for their young for a while and then they they let them go off um and then i think you know conserving the conserving reptile amphibians probably the biggest thing for it is start them young um there's a lot of like older people who they have their opinions of snakes set in concrete and i kind of think that those people are probably lost causes you know Mm. um like my my redneck cousins and stuff like i'm never gonna get them to like snakes i might be able to convince them to like not kill non-venomous snakes uh, but i'm never gonna get them to like snakes but yeah. if you really want to do active conservation, um, kids are real eager to learn about this sort of stuff. And they just, they absorb whatever facts you give them. Um, and if you can teach them like, hey, snakes are cool, don't kill them. Um, hey, snakes are cool, like let's actively try and conserve them. They're the ones who are then going to go home to their parents and say like, hey, dad, don't kill any more snakes in our garage. Uh, we can call this dude to come get it out of here or it'll just go off on its own. Um, so I think that's probably something that's the best step that we can take is start 
educating people when they're young. And then, you know, I've got like neighbors and stuff that call me when they see a rattlesnake and whenever that happens. And I'm sure like, you know, most herpers do the same sort of thing. There's people with your number in their phones who will call you. Um, and whenever that happens, like if I go over there and it's a non-venomous snake or something, I'll, I'll try and convince the person like, Hey, just let's, let's sit and watch it and like, watch it go off on its own. It doesn't want to bother you. It doesn't, it doesn't want to be around you. It doesn't like you. Um, and I think that you can start convincing people um, slowly, but surely. Uh, Cause yeah, getting the general public on our side is absolutely paramount to uh, proper conservation. Um, slightly different tangent, but I'm, mm -hmm. I'm kind of interested in learning about the uh, herping in, in and around uh, San Antonio, like, you know, what, what to find and where to go to find them. So stuff. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. So like I said earlier, Texas or San Antonio kind of sits at this intersection of all these different habitats. And so if you go like north, south, east or west of San Antonio, herping can change a whole lot. Um, like if you go south of San Antonio, you're into like the South Texas sort of thorn scrub stuff. And I would say like you can cruise a whole bunch of stuff if you can find anywhere to flip. Um, then, you know, you can usually turn up a whole bunch of snakes. Um, down south of, tech, of San Antonio, you can get like indigo snakes and um, Great Plains rat snakes. You can get Texas tortoises, collared lizards. Um, that's the reticulated collared lizard, the, the one that's got really restricted range in Texas. Um, and you can also like flip milk snakes, um, desert king snakes, all sorts of stuff. You can also cruise those things. Um, you know, on, on a good night. And that's all within, you know, an hour of San Antonio city limits. Uh, but then if you go like North and West, you're getting into the Texas Hill country and everything changes. Um, like road cruising in the Hill country is really not productive or feasible. Like, yeah, I found a few good snakes road cruising, but it just takes hours and hours and hours to, to see anything. Um, in the Hill country, you really got to like, find a state park or a wildlife management area, or if you can get on private land and hike around. Um, and even then in the hill country, like flipping, <laughs> flipping isn't that great. Um, every once in a while you can have some luck, but it's, you really got to get out and hike for stuff. And then if you go like Northeast of San Antonio, it's like black land prairie. And if you lay out, you know, a six foot by three foot board, uh, and come back three months later, there's probably going to be like 15 Western diamondbacks underneath mm. it. And a couple coach whips. Um, like my, my best advice for herping like North and East of San Antonio is mm. as you're driving, you see mattresses and like old real estate signs and stuff just on the side of the road. And you'll be like, Oh, that thing's like, there's no way that there's a couple that there's snakes under that. Like that doesn't look like a good board or something. Just go flip it. Um, Cause there might be a whole bunch of rattlesnakes underneath it or something. One of my best, probably like my most productive spot within, you know, a 20 minute drive of my house is literally just some random boards on the side of like a really busy highway um, mm -hmm. that most people, even herpers probably wouldn't think to stop at. Cause it's like, it doesn't look good at all. Um, but I've found, you know, both possible species of king snakes there. That's the speckled and um, prairie king snakes. I've gotten Texas rat snakes. I've gotten coach whips. I've gotten, you know, copperheads. And, you know, I once flipped one of the boards and got eight rattlesnakes underneath it, just all coiled up on like a day when it was like 50 degrees out. Wow. Um, but then like also around San Antonio, you get a bunch of weird cool species like you can get the texas alligator lizard which is this you know texas endemic species well it, it lives all throughout mexico um but in texas you can either find it in the chisos mountains out in big bend or you can find it in the hill country um and they they've got really spotty kind of locally common distributions uh you get barking frogs which are have a pretty big range but 
are only active on really rainy nights. Um, then you get all of the central Texas sort of stream salamanders, all these different ureseas um, that in some spots, every single spring has a new species. Um, even if two springs are like a mile away from each other, if they're in a different spring system, a different underwater system, then, you know, it's two different species basically right next to each other. Um, and then within like an hour of San Antonio, you can get timber rattlesnakes and blacktail rattlesnakes. You can get indigo snakes. Um, you can get three different species of king or three different species of king snakes. Um, maybe two different species of milk snakes. One definitely. The other one might be a little little farther away. Um, so there, there's just like good stuff here, um, but it's different in any direction that you go. As for herping, like in San Antonio itself, like there's a bunch of really sketchy green belts with a bunch of trash to flip um, and you can go flip them. I'm sure all of us herpers have done that. Mm -hmm. Gone to some place where you're like, hmm, I might get like shot or attacked here, but it <laughs> looks like a good yes. spot for snakes. <laughs> I, uh, I, I took a girl herping once down here and absolutely there's a spot where <laughs> we pull in and she, she's sitting there saying I, I this is this is like this is we're gonna get killed here i promise you and stuff but i saw <laughs> i saw this lizard as we pull in and i like wasn't paying attention to anything she was saying i just bolted out of the car and went running back to where it was and i'm trying to like i'm keeping an eye on the lizard but I'm also keeping an eye on her, trying waiting for her to get out so I can lock the car because it is a really sketchy area. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But she's taking so long to get out of the car because she's scared it's a sketchy area. I'm like, come on! And so yeah, <laughs> she wasn't she That's... wasn't very interested about that because I went running off and she <laughs> left it there. Yeah. But yeah, didn't you it's... once stumble into a commute uh, homeless area looking for agamas? Yeah, yeah. It, actually, it was actually very close to there that that happened <laughs> <laughs> of course it was <laughs> i've i've had like the same thing in around san antonio and austin it's like not paying attention it's like oh i'm back on like a power line cut or something behind a building like oh i'm flipping these boards and next thing i know i'm getting like yelled at by like a homeless dude who's like trying to throw bottles and cans at me because i'm because i'm in his spot or something you got to run away real quick i um uh, i parked there's this I, so I work for Collier County doing mosquito research. And one of the areas where I put my traps, there's just this big population of green amoebas, just really weirdly in between these two buildings and stuff. I was like, wow, that's really cool. So I went back after work and parked in that spot. And with a, cause they're super fast and the area just isn't great for trying to catch them. Cause there's just a bunch of junk and everything. So I was going to try a new one. So I always keep my fishing poles in my, in my, in my trunk. And so I took one out and I went, trying to noose it and um i'm like getting really close to one about to and all of a sudden i hear someone behind me and i look and the cops show up apparently the lady leaving to close the store thought it was really weird that someone was parked there and called the cops on me <laughs> so i mean uh, that's like that's what it means to be a herper is to just like go hang out in spots where no one has any good reason to hang out and either get yelled at or have the cops called on you or something and then they're like what are you doing here and you're like oh i'm I'm looking for snakes and they're like quit lying what are you doing here? Yeah, right exactly <laughs> like no i'm actually looking for snakes and they they think you're weird because you're standing there in like a like between two buildings in some woods with a fishing pole like you're a psycho mm -hmm. you know <laughs> i i have those sort of interactions with border patrol all the time where i'm like down by the the border or something and they stop me and pull me over and they're like and it's like really weird for for someone to be there it's like hey why are you like hiking around on this hill that's you know a mile from the u.s mexico border and there's no good reason to be here like what are you doing i'm like oh i'm looking for snakes and they're like i don't believe you like you're you're picking up a, a drug dump or something i'm like no i'm actually looking for snakes and pull out your camera or something and show them like look look don't arrest me it's it's <laughs> snakes i swear and then once they finally realize that, oh, you actually are looking for snakes, they're like, oh, you're even weirder than I thought you were. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Me me and Nate, we, before I moved down here, we took a trip down here and we were fishing at a spot down in the Keys and we heard a toke gecko. So we went looking in the trees for it. And 
a guy started yelling at us on the other side of the trees. He's like, "What are you guys doing?" We told him we were looking, we we're looking for a, a gecko. He's like, "Is that the best excuse you can come up with?" <laughs> <laughs> and so we ended up, we ended up just walking away. We didn't, but apparently the guy had, had kids like stealing from his stuff. So that's so he, I, yeah. he gets you know some, some reason for suspicion. But yeah, he, he's just like yeah okay <laughs> yeah i mean you win some you lose some like sometimes you get yelled at and told to leave i've had other times where like someone was like oh can you come over to my property and and get right. some snakes and stuff and it's like yeah absolutely although it seems like whenever i have somebody say that like oh i got snakes all over my property you can come get them i go there and there's like never anything there or, or something like that or it's just like a bunch of garter snakes and it's like oh okay yeah yeah i had a family friend that uh they found they saw one copperhead in their yard and like the entire mm-hmm. life of them being there and they asked me to do like a full survey of the yard to find out where the copperheads are coming from if there's any more and all this stuff so i was like man all right i, I don't think i'll find anything but i went out at you know nine o'clock mm-hmm. ten o'clock and i actually had i just my dad had just gotten a camera that can look really deep into holes you did that for oh, nice. some construction thing so i took that I didn't see a thing. So yeah, yeah, it's never as good as people say it is. Yeah, he yeah. They ended up paying me pretty good for that, which I told him I was like, you don't have to pay me. I honestly didn't do anything. I just walked around your yard. I didn't catch anything. So, but hmm. nice guy. Yeah, I had a neighbor call me a few weeks ago, or I guess like probably back in October or something saying she's like there's a coral stick in my yard come get it and you know by the time i got there you know she'd whacked at it with a shovel and missed and so it went down a hole and you know there's no way i was gonna find it yeah um and so i walked around for like 30 minutes and flipped some rocks and i was like hey like it's it's gone call me if it comes back and she's like oh here take this money i'm like i'm like i just like stood in your backyard for 30 minutes like I'm not gonna <laughs> <take the money." laughs> that's awesome <clears throat> but it's i mean i don't know I I bet like every single herper has that sort of story, you know, someone telling you to come get snakes out of their yard or saying like, Oh, my property's full of snakes. And then you go there and it never is. We, um, <laughs> the same Florida trip when we went down, we were looking one, one of us was, there's four of us or three of us. One of us was fishing. The other one was, I don't know what Nate was doing. And I was, I was, I was looking for iguanas and then I decided to come back, but I was trying to meet them halfway. So I was like dragging this kayak along the side. Oh, of the no, not this one. <laughs> and, and the police pulled us over. Well, pulled Nate, pulled Nate over because I guess the way we interacted, I guess, looked suspicious and I'm dragging a kayak down the side of the road. So, <laughs> and his phone broke or died or something. And so he couldn't hmm. contact us, but yeah, he's trying to tell, the the police officer yeah we're down here we have a 15 passenger van our school gave us and we brought down a six foot lizard to trade with this guy or to give to this guy and stuff and now we're looking for reptiles and i get the police officer wasn't buying it but nate can tell you more because he actually interacted with the police officer more about it but (laughs) i'd rather not (laughs) yeah matt was standing like 100 feet down the sidewalk he was just staring at me yeah, because mm. I was tired. I freaking dragged that kayak. You would not believe how far I dragged that kayak. <laughs> I was tired. <laughs> I was. I actually carried it. I started dragging it because I was so tired. So I saw something was going down. I was like, "Well, if he starts getting into handcuffs, then I'll go." But I'll just sit here and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, he's he's fine on his own. He can deal with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, it's it's so funny how like to us and to I, I'm sure the herpers listening like these are all very normal stories. You know, this Absolutely. is just how it happens. But like, I tell these kind of stories like at Thanksgiving dinner in front of like my cousins or my <laughs> uncle or something. And they're like, what are you, what are you doing? Like you're living, you're living in a fantasy world where these things happen to you. Um, right. Yeah. Like it's just, I, I remember yeah. in, in high school, once got kicked out of a cracker barrel. Because back in high school, I used to breed like corn snakes and stuff and was meeting a guy to trade corn snakes. We're like, oh, we'll meet at the Cracker Barrel here off the side of the road or whatever. Um, 
and like went and met him and like we had the snakes and I think we were getting lunch or whatever. People were like, you can't, you can't bring snakes in here. What are y'all doing? Like, why are you ever like, it's just, a, they're corn snakes. They're like, yeah. pets. like everybody has one. They're like, you guys need to, you guys need to leave. You can't be doing this here. <laughs> I, there's, okay. So there's this, it, it, it doesn't exactly have to do with it, but it relates. So there's a, there's a, a bit that Bill Burr, the comedian, I don't know if you've heard of him, does. Yeah. It, and he, but he, he talks about how he was in Georgia um, and, or no, yeah, he was in Georgia and some, some guy asked him to mow his lawn mm-hmm. or something like that. He was, I think he was working landscaping or something like that. So he, he was mowing his lawn and then the guy comes out and he's like, Hey, um, I just got this new gun and there's an area out here where we can go shoot it at this car. Um, when I, when I come shoot it and he, and he's telling this bit in Georgia too and the mm-hmm. whole crowd's silent and he like pauses and I'm sitting there thinking I was like that's weird why do you pause and then he goes at this point most people are laughing but you guys this is so normal to you <laughs> he's like, you don't think anything of it you're just wait, you're still waiting for the punchline <laughs> mm-hmm. I was like but everywhere else that's weird and I, I thought that was really funny because the whole time I was sitting there thinking I was like yeah this is that's that's what happens. That's pretty normal. People do that all the mm-hmm. time. So I was I was I was sitting there. I was literally did what he said. I was sitting there waiting for the punchline. I was like, "What is he? Where is he going with this?" So I just. But it's the same thing with Herpers. Like we tell it's stories. Just, it's pretty. It's weird things that that we do. Like you know, other non Herper friends will ask me like, "Oh, like what you what you do last weekend or something?" I'm like, "Oh, well, I drove out to West Texas and I." you know, stayed up until 4 a.m., like, hiking cuts and stuff, and it was, and, like, eating junk food, and then I slept in my car on the side of, like, a busy highway right next to the U.S.-Mexico border, and they're, like, that's insane, like, why would you do that? I'm, like, oh, no, that's pretty chill, like, that's, that's, like, not even the, the weirdest thing that I did this month in, in regards to herbs or something, uh, and they, and they, they just don't get it, I guess. I go in the Everglades all the time and sleep in my car for, like, three day weekends or two day weekends or whatever. My boss tells me all the time. She's like, one of these days you're not going to show up to work and I'm not going to think you quit. I'm just going to think you're dead in the Everglades somewhere. (laughs) That's like, I don't know that I've got so many friends that are just like, yeah, someday Saunders just isn't going to come back. You know? (laughs) Um, I mean, I, I, I work out in like some of the most remote regions in the lower 48 um with like no cell phone service or anything and it's just yeah i guess i guess it is plausible that someday you know something happens but it's 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 what you got to do if you want to find if you want to find snakes and also like i don't know the the, there's nothing or i guess how do i want to put this uh i like taking risks you know other people see that sort of stuff as a, a risk but it's it's more interesting than what most of my friends are doing, you know, oh, Absolutely. How, yeah. how they pass their time. I've got no idea. Um, <laughs> what do you mean? You're not out there like trying to, to find your white whale or something. You mean you haven't obsessed over trying to find this one species for like the past two years? Like, what do you do with your time? Yeah. I the exact same way. I'm just like, what do other, what do people do? Like, how are you not just in the woods all the time? <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> no, absolutely. It's oh. Matt, you got any other questions? Um, I, I do I do actually have a question mm-hmm. that you may not know. Someone asked me today, and so I was waiting for the like the end of the podcast to ask because it, it doesn't necessarily have to do with your expertise. And Nate, you might know, but someone asked me this question today, and I didn't know the answer, and I'm really curious what it is. So someone asked me because I was telling them I was telling them um, about American the alligators and crocodiles and why the area it's too salty for alligators for the most part and crocodiles could live in it but we're on the west coast of Florida so there's only there's like as far as I'm aware of that that they know there's only six American crocodiles in the Marco Island airport and then there's like three in Ding Darling up by Sanibel the rest of them are on the east coast of Florida they were asking why they're all in the east coast of Florida and there's not any on the west coast If I had to take a guess, I would say lack of suitable habitat since American crocs do need a lot of mangrove habitat to live mm. in. 
and the, all those keys and islands along the east coast provide plant that right type of habitat whereas that well i know there's not that much of it on the west coast so hmm. i said the same thing as far as the habitat i didn't know about the mangroves because that is interesting because in general the west coast from my understanding has more mangroves but down in like this keys in the very southern part of the eastern part there are a lot of mangroves and that's where you typically find them so yeah i would say I, I don't know exactly the the reason for that but it'd be interesting to look at historical records because maybe in yeah. the past they were they were all over i mean yeah i don't know from what i've read historically american crocs have been pretty limited to the at most extreme southern parts of florida and the keys so this, well in the east it's like they it's like the fringe of their habitat so the fringe yeah, of their and, yeah, and the East Coast stops much uh, more north than the West Coast. Or the, the West Coast stops more north than the East Coast. The East Coast goes farther south than the West Coast does in Florida. So. Hmm. And that's where they're found is in that southern, the, the southern part of the East Coast. So, I know, like, back in the day, they used to be found um, on, like, uh, what is it, like the Thousand Islands and stuff on the West Coast? Yeah. You know, that used to be a pretty good area for them oh there's historical records of them like all the way up to like tampa and stuff that's cool wow apparently a few years ago i heard there was like a transient one that washed up on myrtle beach so jeez hmm. yeah i from the research and i haven't done like a ton of research into it but the research i've done is the only ones that they found um on the on the west coast is the the couple in sanibel which were placed there i'm pretty sure and then mm. Um, there's six in the Marco Island airport, which is near the 10,000 islands. Mm -hmm. Um, but as far as I'm aware, there's not any in the, in the 10,000 islands that, that, or at least that people know of mm. right now. I read a book about like historical, uh, it was about, um, Edgar Watson and like colonizing the, the 10,000 islands back in like the early 1900s and stuff. And I know in it, they mention seeing crocodiles as well as alligators in the 10,000 Islands. But I don't know specifically why the, the Western side would be, um, would be less optimal for them. Um, I don't know, maybe there's not like as good nesting areas. Um, you know, they've got plenty of habitat for adults, but maybe there's, there's not many places to lay to, to build nests, but I don't know that specifically. I, I've, I've only ever seen American crocodiles once um, down in Flamingo and Everglades National Park. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the one big boy that's always sitting there that everybody yeah. else has seen. Um, gorgeous animal. Uh, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. That's uh, I don't know, it's an interesting little biogeographical pattern. Um, that's, that's interesting you say about the nesting thing though, because a lot of the, the 10,000 islands has a, land that's there that'll be there even during high tide and stuff mm -hmm. there's a lot of usable land but other than the 10,000 islands most of the mangrove areas there they're the uh it floods completely at high tide there's no usable land there which is why mm -hmm. there's not really any a lot of snakes out there there's really only that mangrove salt one of the reasons at least that you mm -hmm. really only get the mangrove salt marsh snake out there so it's possible i don't I don't go all the way there on the east coast the whole time it's possible that maybe there's more usable land on a lot of the islands out in the mangrove um, habitat there. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. It'd be interesting to look at, you know, if if humans have like pushed them back from areas they used to occupy. Um, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's something they just they just don't like. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know. I told them. I told I told them I didn't know, but I assume it has something to do with just the the habitat there's probably more usable habitat on the east coast but that's all minute no mm. so that was interesting i thought i'd ask see what you guys thoughts were uh, now you got me curious yeah i know <laughs> all right well i guess that's a good place to wrap up the thing so solder yeah, yeah, well, so hey it was great talking to y'all um i had a, a whole lot of fun i, I love talking about this stuff Absolutely. Yeah, this is a lot of fun. And um, uh, definitely reach out whenever you want to come down and look for Southern Duskies. Anytime between now and June, 
because June I leave for Australia to go get my master's. So, so anytime okay. between now and June, if you want to go, I, I can see if I can make that happen. I'll see about it. Unfortunately, grad school is not known for uh, having a lot of time off, but no, yeah. I was thinking about trying to get over there like spring break or something, try and go back east, bounce around a little bit. So we'll see yeah. if I can make it happen. Absolutely. Cool. All right. Thanks for coming on the show. Yep. Thank you all very much. No problem.